Hello everyone and welcome to week three. I like to say module three. This week we're gonna talk about the importance of context and choosing a visual. So let's get and get started. Hopefully everyone had a wonderful week. Uh, this is week three of the MBA course of 12 weeks. Um, hopefully uh, everyone's feeling a little bit more excited that we are in the yellow phase. If you are in the Pittsburgh PA area, um, there are other areas that are in different phases. So working our way to somewhat normal life. So uh, hopefully uh, week two was uh, comfortable. You guys felt good about week two. Uh, week three will be kind of similar. Each week we'll have a summary, as I mentioned. Uh, we'll do a, a, um, a uh, lecture like this. Uh, sometimes will be a video lecture uh, where you see me on the screen as well. And then also in addition to that, um, if we have something that's a lab oriented, there'll be a lab video as well. So that way it provides you, uh, instead of providing you a piece of paper, it provides you some way of visually identifying what you have to do. Um, and I'll remember to make sure that my video is public next week. So thank you for the individual in the class who identified that. So this week outline is weekly visual summaries, the importance of a context, choosing the right visual, and then we'll talk about next week and then lab week, lab work. So we create three of the traditional visualizations that we reviewed last week. So at this point, uh, you probably have sent me a video on it and I'll look at it. So let's talk about context. So um, I'll put a couple images up here. So when you are doing, it doesn't matter what type of presentation that you're doing, you have to understand who's your audience. Now I put uh, in this image here, it looks like they're on maybe American Idol or something like that. So you have to think about if you're presenting to somebody, who are you presenting to? Um, think about the audience. Is the audience, so for example, I've been to different uh, um, different types of uh, uh, environments where someone does a, uh, a, like a keynote on a new product or a new software that's coming out. And some of these events, you know, they push alcohol toward you. So you get some people in, a, in the audience have had two or, or a few more, a few many drinks that they should have been. So maybe they're falling asleep or they're not really concentrating. Or if it's like a dry type environment, um, like the, over on the right here, I'm actually presenting. Uh, I did a uh, thing for Hair Point Park um, this semester. And I did a talk on security, um, security around software. And so I talked about. What I do outside of Point Park as, uh, as an application manager where our team uh, provides security throughout an organization where we ensure that applications that are internal or can applications are being um, proper security to prevent uh, the best, best way that we can um, from hacking and ensuring that things are secure. So my audience in that picture was... Uh, some faculty members, there was some students, there were some grad students. So it was a mixture of different people. And there were also some people from organizations that work in the industry that wanted to come and learn about security um, and how it uh, works with software. So my audience was uh, a mature audience. Uh, so I got good questions um, that were relevant to, and then they were also providing pizza. So a lot of people came. Um, so you had that, but so you got to think about your audience, who, who you, who are you presenting to? So these are important ideas. So w when you put your, um, your thing together. So for example, one of the other things is when I interviewed for the position at Point Park, I had to do a, um, I had to do an exercise and the exercise was a, uh, the teacher class per se about software. So they gave me the software title was JavaScript. And I had to come up with a concept of what is JavaScript and you know, what's it used, some keynotes and stuff like that. So I didn't know who my audience was, which would have been helpful. And it was just faculty members. Some were had a background in technology, others didn't. So the ones who didn't actually had really good questions because 
they didn't really know what they were asking. So it turned out to be a pretty good um, exercise. So it just depends on who, who that is. Um, what? So what are you presenting? What's the action? What are you looking to get out of that? What's the mechanism that you're utilizing and the tone that is involved? So there's three different things that are going on here. Um, what is your ultimate goal to, to uh, present? Go into it having, I wouldn't say expertise, but close to expertise so that you can answer questions and, and answer these questions as quickly as possible. It's very helpful. helpful. Mechanism is understanding the person, what they're asking you. Understand their, uh, what they're looking to get out of it. And then the tone, always keep it professional. Um, so, and then the how is how do you come with this? How do you come up with this? So who, who's your audience? So we mentioned that more specific is you can be about your audience is the better the position you will be to be successful. So you look at these people down below celebrities, Tom Hanks, you know, let's say that you told a bad joke and you get that impression. Well, he wasn't Im impressed or you said something bad to Rita Wilson and she took it the wrong way and she looks like that and looks like she has a, a bottle of champagne. And then you have uh, Jimmy Kimmel over here laughing in the audience. Um, so you told a good joke. So you've got the reaction that you're looking for. And then you have LeBron James over here with his wife look, looking like something just like they've never seen. They're looking at something new for the first time. And they're like, what was that? In reality, what they're looking at is their son just did a dunk for the first time. So they were kind of blown away. They were excited. They were like, wow, that just happened. So these are different audience people. Um, different messages for different audiences. Tom Hanks, that can mean anything. Rita Wilson, if I see that, I think I did something wrong. Um, Jimmy Kimmel, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm like, well, whatever I said was great. Or did I say something that made him laugh and that's not what I was going for? And then like LeBron and his wife. So identify the decision maker, you. Are you new to the audience or knowing? Do they trust you? Do you have an established credibility? All four of these people have credibility. Um, but when you're going into a blind audience where you don't know um, Adam the Eve, who, who these people are, then you, know, you might have a different opinion. So what action? What do you need your audience to know or, or do? So that's a good question. So let's say that you are showing a graph on demographics of how many people contacted COVID within the first two to three days that lived in um, parts of Asia and how did it um, get from Asia to other countries so quickly? Who's your audience? Are they doctors? Are they scientists? That's what you have to think about. Why should they care about what you say? Well, if you have something good to present to them and say, hey, I have this study here, and this study shows how numbers increase over a certain amount of time based off of X, Y, and Z. If you have something that they want to learn, then you'll have their attention the whole time. Um, you should always want your audience to know or do something. You should want some type of expression. So I'll give you an example. Um, usually on Monday, Tuesday mornings, I would teach uh, introduction to technology class here at Point Park. And I would say something, you know, off the wall and, you know, I'd maybe throw a joke out there or whatever. I'm not the best joke per person. And the students just looked at me like they just woke up or they seen uh, it's like a deer in headlights or just staring at me. That's not the impression I'm looking for. I try to break it up and, you know, get it going, but it's just dry. It's me talking for an hour and them not saying anything. That's not what you want. You want your audience to be entertained. You want to stop um, every once in a while and give them some time to uh, ask questions. That's important. Um, this can lead to discomfort. Um, so like I said, discomfort in this case for me was uh, presenting, talking for 45 minutes to an hour about an important subject and not getting any questions or they just kind of wanted to leave. And that to me was not even worth my time. Um, explicit action or possible next steps. That's, that's important. You want to have some type of action plan. You want to know what the next steps are going to be. 
And the mechanism in that is how will you communicate to your audience? So you're either doing it in person or you're doing it like me right here. I'm, I'm making an audio, basically video of me talking to you. Um, it could be through Zoom. It could be so many different mechanisms. So this right here shows a little um, example of a live presentation. Someone's talking. You have an audience in the seat. Um, so amount of control uh, you have. What's the level of detail? High, low? Um, who's your audience? So there's all different ways of doing this. Let me ask you this. Who's ever gone live on their social media, which, whether it's Instagram or Facebook? Um, what are you looking to get out of that? I have did it uh, mainly through Instagram, and it's been a while since I did it. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, you get all these people pop on and maybe they're just intrigued to see what you have to say. And if you don't have anything important or anything um, exciting, then they pretty much don't care. They're going to drop off. So that's important. Uh, all right. What tone do you want to set? Is it some type of celebration? Are you celebrating something, something good that happened? What's the drive that you're looking for? Um, is it serious? Is it going to be something funny? Is it going to be relaxing? Um, what is it? Um, so recently, probably a couple of weeks ago, uh, my group, we had a, um, I wouldn't say it was a happy hour. It was just like we took an hour out of our day because everybody, uh, as I mentioned, everyone's in different time zones. We have people on the West Coast. We have people in Ireland. We have people um, in South America, people in the United States, so every, or different parts of the U.S., uh, East Coast, um, Central. And the thing is, we just wanted to take an hour out of our day to kind of forget about everything that was happening at work and everything that was happening in the real world and kind of um, – Get everybody in there nice time. So, you know, we all wore different hats. Some of us had cocktails, uh, depending on the times of the day was. And it was just a way for us to kind of ease up and talk about what's happening. What's, you know, something different than work. So that's what you want here. So what data is available that will help you make my point? So this is also important too. So if you have data collected, like going back to COVID, you can present some type of data that could be beneficial, something that it can be um, show some type of evidence. So data becomes the supporting evidence of the story. So you know, you, if you have something that tells a good story, then it's helpful. So who, what, and how? Case study. So you're, let's say that you're a fourth grade science teacher You've just completed an experimental pilot learning program. You had pre-survey of students, so you knew that you're going to have maybe between 10 and 20 students. Uh, Post-survey, eh, you only had 16 students and sh shows success. So you're coming up with a concept of what you're trying, what you're trying to look at. So you know the pre-survey, the post-survey, the shows of success. Um, so in this case right here, uh, you did experiment. Who's your audience? Is it parents? Is this something that you're, um, you work with your students and then you're going to present to the parents? Or is it something that you're going to present to the students and maybe the parents later? Or is it going to be something with you and the students presenting to the parents and the teachers? So you have to figure out what, what are you looking to accomplish here? Um, budget committee, which controls the funding. Um, so in this case right here, there might be a reason that you need a budget. Um, so the budget would be based off the experiment that you did. Um, if it's at the school and you have the parents comment and stuff like that, that's free, but you have to get the budget. And a lot of times people are using their own funding. So what? Success of the program and ask for specific funding. So if it's something educational and it's something maybe, not even something so new, but something that presents a, a dynamic that the school is going to be proud of. They can use it um, for other bigger fundings in the future than yeah, if it's a thousand bucks or something like that for your experiment and it goes well, then yeah, it could be, that could be a success plan. Um, how? Illustrate success with data collected on surveys. So if you do do a survey of whatever the case is, um, and you collect the data. Um, so like, for example, take TV shows. So I see all these surveys out there and I've been saying for years, I was like, you know, I'll see the Nielsen ratings. I'm like, I never get anything from Nielsen. 
And an interesting thing that happened, and we watch a lot of TV. Um, I probably watch like 20 different TV series um, per year, which is too much, too hard to keep up with. Um, my series I like to watch are the Chicago B PD, the Chicago Med, the Chicago Fire. Um, anything in that realm is a, a big fan of mine, Blue Bloods. Um, I like those types of shows, um, that, like the network shows, and then there's like the Netflix series that you see and so forth. But um, anyways, what I'm trying to get at is uh, Nielsen sends these things out, and they finally sent something to us like about a month ago. And it's so weird that they give us $2, like two $1 bills, crisp, and then I did a survey, and then they sent us something again. We got five bucks, and then they just sent us something again. We got ten dollars, and so I've always wanted to be involved with that because it's important because we watch a lot of TV in the house, and I wanted to present that. So, illustrate success with data collected of surveys. So in this case right here, they're sending me money. So I have bugs hitting my screen while I'm talking here, so it's annoying. Um, I have to turn the light out, and maybe, but this light's bright. So. You know, by presenting money to people, they're going to be excited to do it. Um, so that could be a success right there. All right, so we are on slide 15 of 58. Yes, I know. It's a long way. All right, so who? The budget of committee that can approve funding for a continuation of the summer learning program. Uh, what? The summer learning program on science was a success. Please approve budget X to continue. How illustrate success with data collected through the survey conducted before and after the pilot program. So maybe the survey was um, the you got the survey through the parents and through the kids. And you said if X, Y, and Z was going to happen, this is what the outcome was going to be. And you were able to present it to whoever your audience was. Maybe it's the board, school board, and you're looking for $500 to 1000 or $2,000. They need to have a really good case on why you need that money and how it's going to affect and at the end of the day yes the students are important but they want to have a bigger picture how is this going to make us look you know what i mean because every time this home wants two thousand dollars we're just going to say yeah and we're all over but no you could tell them how beneficial it will be and how it will make the school look and how they could get funding from the federal government and other places that's what you want and then also, let's say that you are a private school and you say, hey, at our school, we're doing this, this, and that. Then you entertain people. You encourage, they're like, oh, that's awesome. This is where I want to go to school at. Um, consulting for context. What's the background information? Is it relevant or essential? So what do you have to work with? Who's your audience or decision maker? And we mentioned that already. Um, what biases does your audience have that might make them supportive of or resistant to your message. Um, what data is available that would strengthen your case? Um, is our audience familiar with the data or is it new? Where are the risks? There's always risks. What factors could be could weaken in case could do we need to proactively address them? What would a successful outcome look like? And if you had a limited amount of time or a single sentence to tell your audience, what they need to know, what would it be? So all these things play a part. You know, ultimately you're trying to get funding, but in order to get funding, you have to come up with a plan. And what we're trying, what I'm trying to talk about here is at the end of the day, we're talking about how we present ourselves, how we present a data model, how we present, how we talk about stuff. And so not everybody is a salesperson, um, but you know, from, uh, technology background, IT, computer science, whatever the case is, you always have to sell your product in an essence because you're selling it to somebody, whether you're actually making money off the product, but you're presenting something, something new. So it's important. Three minutes. Um, so you have a three minute story and big idea. If you had only three minutes to tell your audience what they need to know, what would you say? And I think that if you're well prepared, you'll come up with something. You want to hit all the hot topics right off the bat, and that'll be important ideas. Big idea. This boils down to what? Down to a single sentence, maybe. Um, so find that one sentence 
that makes people think. And they're, when they hear it, they're like, wow, what does that mean? Or they know what it means. Three minute story. A group of us in the science department were brainstorming about how to resolve an ongoing issue that we have with incoming fourth graders. It seems that when kids get to their first science class, they come in with the attitude that it's going to be difficult and aren't going to like it. It takes a good amount of time at the beginning of the school year to get beyond that. So we thought, what if we try to give kids exposure to science sooner? Can we influence their perception? We piloted a learning program last summer aimed at doing just that. We invited elementary school students and ended up with a large group of second and third grade students. Our goal, I'm sorry, our goal was to give them earlier exposure to it, science in hopes of forming positive perception. To test whether we were successful, we surveyed the students before and after the program. We found that going into the program, the biggest segment of students 40% felt just okay about the science, whereas after the program, most of these shifted into a positive perception with nearly 70% of students expressing some levels of interest towards science. We feel that this demonstrated success of the program and that we should not only continue to offer it, but also expand on our reach going forward. So the pilot so in this three minute story, this is good. They, and this, this is, all, this is the truth. You know, you give a student a book and say, chapter one, we're going to learn about, uh, I don't know what we're going to learn about in science. We're going to, you know, learn about atoms and, and, uh, how atoms attract and, and stuff like that. It's, the students don't want to hear about that. You know, it's just going to sound boring. I was a student once in fourth grade. I understand. If you've seen something cool happen, a volcano explode, kids are going to be really interested in it. So going into it, yes, they may not have a care in the world, but actually when they see it happen, they're going to be blown away. So my personal experience is when I started making wine, um, before making wine, I was like, how does it turn into alcohol? And I didn't understand the concept. And I was like, do I really want to put my time into this? Is this something I really want to do? And so it was kind of on the fence. And then when I decided to move forward with it and understood the process and how the different elements, the different, uh, uh, the different instruments that you use, the different um, breakdowns of chemicals, compounds, that's all science stuff that gets involved and all the things that you do, I was blown away. I was absolutely blown away how science works or just in general find them ways that you can you can make alcohol without doing all the other stuff organically and i didn't know all this and now i'm just like all into it and it's just to me is amazing so i love science after i learned that and that's just one piece of it so in this case right here they're telling a good story and this if i read it from a parent i'd be excited because then i know that my students are in the right hand so the pilot summer learning program was successful at improving students perceptions of science and because of the success we recommend it continue to offer it moving forward please approve our budget at, for the program and i think people school board members would love that story they'd be like this is great let's move forward let's do it if we don't have the budget let's figure out how we could get it storyboarding so this is actually interesting so in my class other class i teach is mobile development and so in iOS development, uh, we do storyboarding. And storyboarding basically is screen after screen. Each screen tells something. Um, so, uh, so this kind of goes inside with the things I do in the industry where if we're developing software or like in the past, uh, what we would do is like, for example, our mobile development class, we did storyboarding before we even got into the actual storyboarding. We drew, we brainstormed what, brainstormed what we wanted to create from screen to screen, and then we drew out those items. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So we have an issue. Kids have bad attitudes about science. Kids have bad attitudes about math. Kids have bad attitudes about English. 
Um, so you kind of go know where I'm going here. Demonstrate an issue. Show the student assignment grades over a course of a year. Um, describe a pilot program, goals, etc. Show before and after survey of data demonstrating success of a program. Ideas for overcoming issues, including a pilot program. Recommendations, pilot with success, let's expand, we need money. These are all things that you come up with. So, issues. Um, what's an issue that you can think of um, outside of here? And how can you demonstrate and show someone that over a period of time, it, had, it had went from eh, to a low number and increase. Um, what were the ideas for overcoming issues, including this pilot program? Describe this pilot program. What, what were the goals? So this is all going to be part of your assignment in essence, so please pay attention. <laughs> um, choosing a visual. Importance of a context, choose a visual. Choose the right visual that you think is going to make your audience excited. So choosing an effective visual. Look at this one right here, 91%. Simple text. You have a scatter plot, maybe a line bar, maybe a heat map, uh, maybe a slope graph, maybe a waterfall, maybe a stack horizontal bar, etc. There are all these different things you can um, provide. Um, very effective when you have a number or two to share. Um, so, for example, children with a traditional stay-at-home mother, a percentage of children with a married stay-at-home mother with a working husband. So this is just an example of two different numbers. But the importance here is it's showing you a year, um, an age, and some type of little text below. Um, so this right here, 20% of children had a traditional stay-at-home, blah, blah, blah. So you see where I'm going with this. Um, consider an appendix. Watch heavy borders. So you don't want to add too much. Like the heavy borders, that, that to me is kind of crazy. Um, light borders is pretty good. I won't go with minimal borders because to me it doesn't give enough context. Um, provides more visual. Heat map. Heat map could, could be good. Um, we use heat maps when I work for a biotech company called Salumen. Um, we measure different cells. Um, so usually what would happen is we have this... Uh, um, tube that had 360 cell um, objects or well, cells that would go in there but had 360 slots and we would measure them off a heat map so we had software that did it with heat sensing objects but anyways when we got the data you had lighter lower so you knew where the areas were um, effective so if it's something like that then yeah you know it could be effective but certain other areas a heat map might not be something that could be useful um Graphs well designed, figure the right one out. Um, graphs, points, lines. Um, this right here is a scatter plot. You know, you ha it shows your cost per limit. It shows per month, and it has an average, and you have spots all over the place. Um, same example. This right here is lines. We talked about that last week. Uh, passport, control, wait time. Um, <coughs> employees' feedback over time. So survey, uh, something presentable, favorable, um, employee feedback over time. So same thing as I talked about. Bar charts, um, just an example. Kind of going through this kind of quick because we've seen this last week. Um, bar charts design. Bar charts must have a zero baseline with the bars. Bars should be wider than the space between the bars. However, if you make the bars too wide, your audience may compare volume. Um, so you have too thin, too thick, and just right. Um, you have a single series, multiple series, um, comparing it from simple to difficult. Waterfall horizontal bar chart. Um, here's a stack horizontal bar chart. Um, other graphs, uh, pie charts, donut charts, 3D. So here's your square area graph. Um, so these are all for whoever your audience is. Um, pie charts, you might learn that your audience likes pie charts. Um, it just depends. Donut chart. This one's actually used often, I see. Um, potential issue, 3D, secondary y-axis. As you see here, you have all these different charts, and they all represent a different audience, or whoever your audience is. This right here would be great if you're dealing with um, some type of financial in institution. They would love something like this. Take it from me. I work there. 
Um, and that's pretty much it on the lecture. Now, it started off slow, but it got kind of quick. So next week, we'll talk about the weekly visualization that you'll do a demo on. We'll talk about eliminating clutter, focus, attention, project preparation. So this week, th this is the end of the lecture, but the lab will be a little bit different. It'll be more about talking about what your assignment is and what we're looking for this week. Um, we did some of the different things last week um, and you had some ex exposure to it. So we'll do something similar this week. Okay, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you all have a nice week. And that is it guys, thanks.